thousands, hundreds of you. Listen, I just wanted you to listen to a, just a quick um, passage of scripture before we sing this song. So it has some context for us. It's from Luke chapter 11. Jesus says, I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, Jesus promises, and we've been through this passage, your Father knows what you need before you even ask him. Isn't that cool? And in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, this is a new concept, by the way, in the New Testament. This would have been, like, we kind of accept this as, like, the norm, right? But this was... A, a just an earth-shattering revelation that the Apostle Paul gave to the Romans. He said, You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave to fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, we think of him as our Heavenly Father and our Good Father. We think of him, and we think of him as Abba, Father, that someone we can go to. But that was a brand new idea when the Apostle Paul talked about that. God was always this very powerful, almost intimidating figure. But to us, he is that, but also our Abba Father. Now, I don't know what kind of a father you have. Sometimes you relate to the Heavenly Father, kind of sort of like the father you had. And maybe you didn't have the greatest father. I have a great father, so I can relate to my Heavenly Father so much better. But just know, he's a good, good father. And you're loved. So we're going to sing that. Let's stand up. We're going to sing about our good, good father. Please. 
each of you. I love uh, when scripture, uh, the people who encountered God either named a place or about their experience with God or they began to refer to God with a hyphenated name. Jehovah was the, the name of God, but when people would meet God in a certain way, experience him in a certain way, they would say Jehovah Shammah, which is what we were singing, you are the God who's standing near. I believe that was Hagar, I think, was the one that uh, referred to that. Jehovah Shammah. You know, the Lord is near to us today. He's been near to you every, every day this week. Maybe that's, a, maybe that's the light bulb going on. Maybe you didn't realize that. We don't come here and suddenly realize God's close, but he's been close. The bad thing is we tend to not realize that during our week and maybe we suffer alone and worry alone and not even think about how close God is ready to take our burdens and our cares for us but he is the God who is standing near well it's good to see each one of you today uh, we wanted to take a, a moment to highlight some of our opportunities for church family life and then we're going to open in a word of prayer and continue our worship Today's the uh, Immediately following the service today, we will be having our first planning meeting of the year for our Light in Bethlehem. And the Light in Bethlehem is our Christmas outreach, and it's quite a large event for us, and we start early, sort of preparing for it, planning it. So after the service, we will have our first one. We urge you, if you have time, if you're going to be a part of that, uh, we'd love to... Uh, for you to join us after the, after the service as we think about in some initial thoughts and plans for our Light in Bethlehem outreach. Also, our Caring Outreach group, our ladies are still leading us in the diaper drive for the Meadville Pregnancy Center. And uh, Sizes five and six, this is in your bulletin, I believe. Those sizes are especially what's most needed right now. Sizes five and six of diapers. Um, and also an additional uh, projects, sewing thread of any color, and new or gently used blankets are being collected for a variety of projects. So the women are doing a lot of missions works. They've been making things for women around the world, different various uh, items. And uh, these are some things they need, and we can all be a part of that. Um, so that's in your bulletin. Be aware of that. Uh, also, March the 7th, you want to give the announcement of that about the action Okay, action so Action dinner? often uh, participates in a chili cook-off over at Edinburgh, but this year I don't think they're doing it. So, we're going to make the chili for you. I'm going to make one chili and one soup for March the 7th. It's a Sunday, right after church. We do need some help, though, bringing some other items. And there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby if somebody's willing to bring another couple pot of pots of soup. And a lot of the sandwiches are signed up for. We're going to do soup and sandwich right after the service on March the 7th. So, thanks, Action, for taking that on. Yeah. Good, so put that on your calendar. And sign up. <clears throat> yes, and sign up. Everybody involved. Well, good, good. 
Well, I would like to invite you to stand with me. We're going to unite our hearts in prayer. And God is with us. He was with us before we came in here. He was near to us before we came in here. But we want to acknowledge his presence as we begin our time of worship today. Continue our time of worship. Our Holy Father, we are, we are so thankful as we think about the words that we were singing, these worship affirmations of our relationship with you as our loving Heavenly Father. Lord, uh, what a great encouragement that is for us. Lord, help us to remember these songs and uh, these affirmations and the words especially, Lord, throughout our week. It's just so important. They reflect Scripture. They reflect our relationship with you. They ref reflect your promises for us. And so, Lord, we're thankful for, these, for this time of worship that ministers to you and pleases you, but ministers to us, Lord, as we, as we do this, quite honestly. And we thank you for that. Lord, we gather in your presence today and uh, maybe in different varieties of emotional states today, uh, places in our faith along our journey. But Lord, we gather as the body of Jesus Christ today. We want to encourage one another. We want to support one another. We want to love one another. We want to uplift one another. And we just ask you, Holy Spirit, to stir up our hearts that has praise in it, but just need you to stir it up right now, Lord, for this day. And may the testimony of our lips bring you praise today, Lord. May the joy of our hearts bring you praise today, Lord, as our testimonies of your faithfulness. As we share those today, may they, may they honor you and glorify you, Lord. Lord, we want to say today that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If we haven't done it, Lord, we want, to, we want to just affirm that. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And may you, O Lord Jesus, be rightfully exalted today. Holy Father, may you receive the worship that you alone are worthy to receive. Holy Spirit, we thank you for how you share abroad the love of God in our hearts, how you minister to us, strengthen us, convict us, direct us. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit today. And in these things we ask and pray and give thanks. Amen. Take the blue book in front of you, the hymnal, and open it to 43. Every once in a while, we like to actually open these books and remember what hymns look like. Hymn number 43, and sing it with all of your might to the Lord. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me.
stirred when Faith was reading the scripture this morning. One of the scriptures that she read was how he would give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And I thought of that song we often sing, Come Holy Spirit, we need you. Don't we need him today? In our hearts and in our lives, that others would see Jesus shining through us. Isn't that a desire of our hearts today? Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, we need you. Come, sweet Spirit, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to come into God's house. As the family of God, we can gather for worship. We can come into your presence. As has already been mentioned, we have your presence with us always. And we're thankful for that. But oh, when we gather together, how precious it is to be aware and sensitive that you gather with us. When we gather in your name, you're there. And it's with that in mind that we bring our many needs before you today. Some requests have come in already this morning. As we go to the Lord in prayer, we want to bring these needs. We pray for this neighbor, Jim's son who had a heart attack. Lord, we pray for his salvation. Touch Tracy. Oh God, minister, we pray in a very special way to this need. You know just what that need is. And Lord, may he be sensitive to the fact that his life was spared. And Lord, he needs to make a surrender of his life to you. Holy Spirit, work, we pray. Give this Give them a, an opportunity to witness to this neighbor that he might know Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. 
Lord, we pray that you would be with Ed uh, tomorrow as he faces eye surgery. Minister in a very special way to this need. We'll thank you. We'll thank you. Take away any anxiousness, Lord, and just give an inner peace and an assurance that you're in control. Guide the doctors, give them wisdom and understanding. Be with Wilma, we pray, and minister in a special way to her brother-in-law who's had this very severe stroke. Oh God, touch, we pray, and minister. And Margaret's brother, Ted, who has pneumonia and cancer. Lord, we're glad there's no distance in prayer. We can pray here in Pennsylvania, and you can go to the hospital there in New Jersey, and you can minister to that need. We pray for John Freno's mother, recovering from, a, from several medical problems. Lord, minister in a very special way to her need. Thank you, Lord, for working. Thank you for ministering in that situation, bringing strength and bringing healing speedily. Thank you, Lord, for the good report concerning Fat Carol. And Lord, we pray that you'll continue to help her with her therapy there at home. We know that she's happy to be back home again. We thank you, Lord, that you answered her prayer and she's able to be home. Be her strength and bring healing speedily. Continue to be with Karen, we pray, as she deals with these severe headaches from her brain tumor. And I ask you, God, to just minister peace and comfort and strength in a very special way in her heart and in her life. We continue to remember Dan and T, these two young men who've come to faith in Christ and ask you, God, that you will minister in a very special way in their lives. May they come to know you in a very special way in their life. Holy Spirit, do the work. The word's been shared. Now do the work in their life, we pray. Minister and work, and we'll give you thanks. We'll give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for the many answers to prayer that have been shared this morning. We know, God, that you're on the throne. Thank you, Lord, that Amanda's baby has arrived safely and all is well. Thank you, Lord, for that good report. We give you praise and thanks for that. We pray for the people in Texas. Lord, in this cold weather, we, we're thankful for the heat. We pray for those that are in, in this kind of a situation without that. Lord, would you minister quickly to each and every need. Thank you, Lord, for ministering there. We want to remember Kay Gage in prayer. Lord, dealing with a heart attack and a stroke, blood clots, and Lord, the, the program there needs help. Oh God, you know who those individuals are that can help there. And I pray, Lord, that you would lay it on their heart to be there to, to assist in that very important ministry in our Meadville Pregnancy Center. Thank you, Lord, for working. Thank you for moving. Lord, we pray for our release time groups. Thank you for this ministry that you've given the church. Pray, Lord, that you'll continue to use it for your honor and glory. Give freedom and liberty to the teachers as they share your wonderful word with these dear children as they come faithfully. And Lord, may there be a harvest of precious young souls through this effort, and we'll thank you. Lord, we pray for our nation and ask you, God, to minister in a very special way. We pray for our President Biden and Vice President Harris and ask you, God, to just work in each of their lives. May they come to recognize you as the answer to all of our need. Jesus, minister, we pray. We confess that many times we don't know quite how to pray as we ought, but we do pray, move, bring revival to America, break through the powers of darkness, and bring glorious victory. Lord, we need an outpouring of your Holy Spirit in this country, Begin it right here in our church, we pray. Work in our midst. Work in each one of our lives individually. Let us be yielded totally to you and to the Spirit and to what you have for us to do. The remainder of this service, O oh God, we leave in your hands. 
Pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear today and help us to apply the Word of God to our hearts and lives. We vow to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what a beautiful promise, right? A beautiful promise. Children, children can be dismissed for our children's church. Rest of you, stay seated. We invite the rest of you here to take your Bibles and turn with us to Matthew chapter 7 as we continue through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we've entitled this uh, series on the Sermon on the Mount, The Narrow Way. It's often referred to as the troubled path for the believer in Christ. Today's message is entitled, Prayer That Reflects Our Father's Heart. Prayer that reflects our Father's heart. And aren't you glad that God, our loving Heavenly Father, has given us the opportunity to experience prayer with Him? And to know what type of God we're praying to on the other end, you know, that He does care, He does listen, he has the ability to take everything we speak to him, whether it's theologically correct or a theological mess, whether we're blubbering, whether we're, no matter what it is, God has a way of just, okay, here it is. Just put it all right here. And he can take all that we give to him, all that we vent, all that we express, and he can sift through it and answer it in a way that's absolutely perfect for our situation and brings him the most honor and the most glory. It's important to know the God that we're praying to when we pray to him. Today we are looking at prayer that reflects our Father's heart. So I'm going to be reading chapter 7, verses 1 through 12 today. And please follow along in your Bibles. <clears throat> Do not judge, lest you also be judged. For in the way that you judge, you will be judged, and by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is still in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. Verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. Or what man is there among you when his son shall ask him for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he shall ask for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. Most of us are familiar with this passage of scripture on prayer. However, this, I believe, has a little bit of a different nuance to most of the prayer that we're familiar with. 
Jesus has already spoken about prayer in chapter 6. So maybe he didn't get everything out of his system. Maybe he didn't think of everything he wanted to say. Maybe something came to his mind in chapter 7 that he wanted to tell us. We're going to unpack this. It'll probably take two Sundays to unpack this. But Matthew 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and to the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. As I was reading this, knowing that Jesus already had spoken about prayer, I was thinking about this and several questions came to my mind. Ask. Ask what? I mean, I already covered prayer pretty well earlier. Ask what? And what is it? Ask and it will be given to you. Seek it and you will find it. Knock on it and it will be open to you. So I think it's kind of important to know what this it is. And then the other question that came to my mind is what is the context of this aspect of prayer? What is the context? What happened before it? that would lead up to this, that we need to know, might be helpful enough in learning to understand this, and what's after it. That's the context, what's before and what's after this prayer. So I wanted to take this opportunity, and I did this early on, I haven't done it in a while, to sort of review our journey, biblically, our journey through the uh, Sermon on the Mount also known as the Troubled Pathway. The Sermon on the Mount, if we remember all of these things, and hopefully you'll remember most of this, the Sermon on the Mount basically marks the very beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, not the beginning of his ministry as the Son of God, because he existed before he was incarnate and born into the person of Jesus. But the Sermon on the Mount marks the beginning of Jesus' earthly life or I'm sorry, his earthly ministry, not his earthly life, his earthly ministry. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, roughly at the age of 30. And then Jesus' ministry was three to three and a half years of ministry, we believe we calculated that correctly. But in chapter 3, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. And then in Matthew chapter 4, immediately following that, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days in which he was fasting and being tempted by the devil. That was crucial for the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And then in verse, in chapter 4 and verse 17, Matthew states this, that Jesus began to preach repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the most important phrase in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus began to preach repentance for the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. We refer to this typically as the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And as he preached, as we are told in verse 17, verse 18 says that Jesus began choosing his 12 disciples and calling them to follow him. And then in verse 23... Scripture tells us that Jesus began taking his message on the road. And Jesus went throughout the land teaching and preaching about the good news of the kingdom of heaven and healing all manner of diseases and afflictions and demon possession. 
In doing this, guess what happened? He drew a crowd. Like when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he drew a crowd. So in doing this, Jesus drew a crowd and he preached about the kingdom of heaven. And then he would heal people. He would heal people of things, being blind from birth. People who were demon possessed. People who were crippled because they were demon possessed. And so Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven and then he healed people and left them with a hint or a foretaste of what that eternal kingdom of heaven was going to be like in all of its fullness. That, what he, that which he did, the, the healings and the miracles, was just, just a, a, a hint or a foretaste of what really heaven and the greater fullness of the kingdom of heaven was going to be like. And I believe he left people longing for a whole lot more. He would leave those people longing to experience the kingdom of heaven that he talked about. And then, I want to turn over here to chapter 5. At the end of chapter 4, because of that ministry, Jesus had quite a crowd. So chapter uh, 5 and verse, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 4 in verse 23 through 25 says, Jesus went about Galilee teaching in the synagogues, that was the Jewish house of learning, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease, every kind of affliction, every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him spread. This new prophet, this miracle worker. And the news spread all the way up into Syria. That's a little farther away north. And people brought to him all who were ill taken with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Verse 25. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from far beyond the Jordan. So Jesus is preaching the kingdom of heaven. He's healing people, all kinds of afflictions, uh, difficulties, problems, demons, and everything else. And people were following him. A large crowd followed him. And in chapter 5, the Bible says, When Jesus saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain and he sat down and his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and began speaking and he gave the Sermon on the Mount. It just kind of passes over that in Matthew. His disciples came and sat down. But there was a little bit broader category than just the disciples. So I'm going to ask you to keep your finger right there and turn to Luke chapter Luke chapter 6, and in Luke's gospel, doesn't tell any, anything different, just opens up a little bit more, a little bit more of a complete understanding of who these disciples were. This is part of our review. But as Jesus has given the Sermon on the Mount, he's given the sermon to a variety of levels of people who were uh, referred to as his disciples. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. And it was at this time that Jesus went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when the day came, he called his disciples to, them, to him. And he chose 12 of them whom he also named apostles. So here's the 12 
apostles, the 12 disciples, the 12 main disciples, the apostles. And then it goes on through to the next following verses, 13 through about uh, 18 or something like that. And it speaks of Jesus naming and selecting the 12 of his closest disciples. In addition to the 12, verse 17, verse 17 says, he had descended with them, with the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, and he stood on a level place, and there was a great multitude of disciples. Though so there is a second group of disciples. We have the 12 disciples now as one group, the 12 apostles. We have this second group who are the larger group of disciples, maybe the, seven, maybe the 70 or the 72 that he sent out, maybe the 500 that Paul referred to, we're not sure, but this larger group, much larger group of disciples, believe, uh, followers and learners of Jesus. But then there's a third group, a great throng of people also from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon had come to him. Now this was would have been west of Syria where Jesus had previously gone up and, and traveled and spoken and worked miracles and Sidon and Tyre are right on the coast of the Mediterranean, north of Jerusalem. So all of these peoples, the 12 disciples, the larger group of close disciples, and then these Throngs doesn't say the number, but just these throngs of people who are coming from literally far and wide because of Jesus' ministry. And these were people, it says in verse 18, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits, all being about in the crowd, and all the multitude were trying to touch him for his power was going out from him and healing them all. These three crowds are the ones that Jesus are speaking to and preaching to. The 12 disciples, the 70 or the 72 disciples, the 500 or larger, and then the throngs from the coastlands far and wide are coming to hear him, see him, learn from him, be healed by him, maybe get some demons cast out. But I, this morning, just this morning, maybe it already dawned on you, but this morning there was another group that caught my attention. And that's the group of people on down the line who would read this. Trickle down disciples, I call it. We're trickle down disciples of the original 12, of the original people that, that gathered around Jesus and learned of him on the Sermon on the Mount. We're sort of the trickle down effect and as we read, we learn and we meet Jesus as well. We're the fourth category or the fourth group of people. And all of these were following Jesus, learning and looking to be touched by him, to be ministered. So as we consider all the people who are now followers of Jesus, and I mean literally followers, because the Bible says they would literally follow him physically from place to place, town to town, and to see and to hear and to listen and to watch what he was doing. They wanted firsthand information. They wanted to be their own eye and ear witnesses. And so they followed around Jesus and watched his miracles and learned of his lessons. And with this vast diversity of people, four groups, counting ourselves now, with the vast diversity of people from vast diversity of places and vast diversity of walks of life, there would have been a wide scale of levels of faith in those people. And that's one of the things that we have talked about throughout this series. Many of them would have been true believers in Jesus Christ. And at some point had become, we might say, born again believers in Jesus. Then there would have been people who were seekers or information gatherers. They were interested 
Let's see what this guy has to say. It might be worth listening to. We might want to hear more. We might make a decision to follow him also. So that was one group, the, the seekers. But then there would have been the people who would have been just simply curious, kind of like going to the circus. You know, they got some cool sideshows and they got some acrobats and some freak shows and they'll tell them what we might see there. And so there were probably some of those types of people, just out of sheer curiosity, they were following Jesus around to see what would happen next. But also there were the people who desperately wanted to meet Jesus and were desperate for his healing, life-changing touch for themselves and for many of their family members. If Jesus came to town today, who would you take? You ever think about that? I was thinking about that as I was these. I, wow, people at work, some family members, I was just found myself thinking about that this week. If Jesus was in town, who would I try to get to go see him? Well, isn't he there with each of us? We have him. <laughs> I mean, his body isn't here, but this church is. His influence in my life is here and your life is here. That's what we're doing in testimony time. We're talking about how glorious Jesus has been and faithful God has been in our lives. If we could take those testimonies out of these walls right here and share with people at, I don't know, the Home Depot where I work, Channel Locks, other places. I know they hear about what Jesus is doing at 86 Acres. What if we did more of that? What if we, instead of bringing people to Jesus, brought our understanding of Jesus to the people that we're working with? So these were the people that were coming to meet Jesus, and many of them being healed and restored and transformed. And these people, it doesn't say every single one of them believed in Jesus necessarily, but you can be sure of one thing, every single one, every single person would have never forgotten Jesus. Because he's, he's healed everybody. Can you imagine the newspapers after that? Jerusalem Journal would, would have been, like, we, we, had to, we can't print how, what all is happening. It's so big, it's so unbelievable. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is doing several things. He is reaching out to the people of every level, conceivably, of faith that are following him from every level of society. And he is presenting the character of Almighty God and his eternal kingdom of heaven. He wants people to know what his heavenly Father is like and what the eternal kingdom is is going to be like. Just a hint of it. But he wants them to know it. So he's been preaching it. He's been demonstrating it through his, through his healings. It's interesting in the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus is communicating this to all the people. I just like, I like, uh, you know, you, you get taught something in school and it's a blessing, it's a curse. I don't know, you can't get it out of your head. But I was taught to notice things that are repeated Take note of things that are emphasized over and over again. Uh, it may or may not mean anything of value, but in the Sermon on the Mount, the kingdom of heaven is mentioned at the very least 15 times. Sometimes it's not always the kingdom of heaven. It would be more, but the kingdom of heaven is mentioned 15 times in Jesus' sermon or message to all of these people. He wants them to know that that's an important aspect of his ministry. And then, over 15 times, he gave commands that were thou shalt not. Didn't exactly put it that way, but he says, do not be anxious. Do not judge your neighbor. Do not this or that. So they were kind of the thou shalt nots of the New Testament Sermon on the Mount. 15 times he did that. So he wasn't just 
telling all of these wonderful things they could do or it's going to happen to them. He, he, he gave parameters. This is, this is the good things I want you to do. These are the things I want you to stop doing, you know. And so he kind of balanced that out. Uh, Fifteen times thou shalt not. And then 15 times Jesus refers to his Father in heaven. As Faith mentioned this morning, they didn't they weren't used to hearing Almighty God referred to as our loving Heavenly Father. As someone you could come curl up next to at his feet and, and you know, find find peace and joy and comfort and hope in his presence. But fifteen times those things were, were referenced. And so as he goes through the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gives 10 Beatitudes. The Beatitudes were blessed attitudes. And they weren't promises. They weren't things that they had to do in order for this to take place. They were what they already had, but probably didn't know it. Every Beatitude addresses a blessing that the believing follower of Christ has at that present moment, but they probably don't realize it. He gave ten beatitudes or blessed attitudes. And then he addressed two principles of kingdom influence for the followers of Jesus. And those two influences, you might remember what they were. One comes out of a salt shaker. The other one comes out of a flashlight. What were they? Salt and light. Salt and light. We're on the ball. Salt and light. Both of those were principles of influence, kingdom influence in a world of darkness that Jesus says, these are what these are these to be the character of the citizens of this kingdom of heaven you're hearing about. He gave them two principles of influence, and he gave at least a sampling of six laws that are to govern our dealings with other people in our relationship with God. Six laws that were kind of samples that his followers were to uh, take note of. Every one of them were taken from the Old Testament law. You heard it said, but I say to you, there were six or seven of those he gave. Then in chapter 6, Jesus addresses our personal religious practices, things of importance, things that motivate us to do what we do and urge us to be careful that we don't allow our motive to be our reward. Remember that? But he challenged us with our, with our motives and talked to us and directed us regarding our religious practices, which specifically he spoke on giving, prayer, and fasting. It's from chapter 6 of Matthew that we get the Lord's Prayer that we recite so often in so many contexts. One third of that chapter dealt with the problem of anxiety. Didn't seem like it was, did it, but it was about a third of that chapter dealt with anxiety and its remedy. And then we looked at chapter 7 which is where we are now. And Jesus addresses, I've already covered some of these things, how we are to view others. How we are to view others and treat others. How we are to treat and view and address God in prayer. And then in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, we are given the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And we get that principle that an awful lot of unreligious people quote. Also in chapter 7, Jesus addresses how we are to view our spiritual journey along the narrow way or the troubled path. And in this chapter, he warns regarding end times, false prophets, and those who are truly followers of Jesus, those who are true believers, and those who are genuinely deceived and who have deceived themselves. And Jesus 
ends the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 with the parable of the wise and foolish builders. Rains came down, the floods came up, the wise man and the foolish man. And we will, we will learn the lesson that it is of utmost importance that we are building our spiritual lives on the holy word of God in Jesus Christ, his son. Not man's thoughts, not public opinion, certainly not any person or group's traditions. All of those can be wrong, every last one of them. And so those are, those are some things that Jesus deals with. Those are some things we've already covered, a couple of those things that are yet to come as we go through this chapter. And so we get in chapter 7, and so we've covered the context of this passage on prayer. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find it. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened to us. If we can determine what it is, then we will know what we should be asking for. This verse is taken so far out of context, you can't even see it. It's out of sight. We can't even see it. But if we can determine what it is, ask and it will be given, seek and you will find it, knock and it will be opened to you, then we will know what we should be praying for, what we should be asking for. If we know what it is, we will know then what we should really be seeking. And if we can identify the it, then we know what we're going to be knocking on and what we're going to be behind some door, door number one, door number two, door number three in heaven. But, but Jesus says, you will find it. You, it will be opened to you. Jeremiah 29, verse 13 says, you will seek me and you will find me. And, and there's a condition on this. You will find me when... You search for me with all your heart. When you search for me with all your heart, you'll find me. That's the promise. So as we, as we look at this, if you think about the promise that's in this passage of Scripture, that askers, people who ask, are people who he promises will be receivers. And he promises that those who seek are going to find it. There's not a, just a maybe. There's not about, well, give it your best shot and we'll just see what happens. He promises you will receive it. You will find it. And he promises that everybody knocks that the door is going to fly wide open. And there it will be. So I'm going to ask you right now. What do you think the it is? Just think about it to you in your own mind. You're welcome to shout it out if you want. But what do you think the it is? We're not going to learn today what it is. Stay tuned next week, and we're going to come, and go, hopefully we'll learn more accurately um, what the it is. And I would say the it is like a trinity. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, like the Godhead. I believe there's this it is a three in one type of a blessed principle that should govern our lives, but even more so should govern our prayer life. If we pray along these measures, the Bible promises, Jesus promises, those, those prayers will be answered as we prayed them. 
I want to know what that is. And we'll pick up on that next week. I did want to just share two quick things in closing. Two of the most important things in the context of this, the whole Sermon on the Mount. And we can listen, we can read the Sermon on the Mount and think, wow, isn't that interesting? Isn't that wonderful? Uh, you know, no more you know, heaven, eternal kingdom, no more death, no more dying, no more sickness, no more demon possession, no more troubles, no anxiety, no more problems, no more judging. All of these things. All of these things. And I believe that everything that Jesus was teaching was his way of trying to manifest a little bit more of the kingdom of heaven on earth. But the most important question is this. Am I, am I a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? And I equate the kingdom of heaven with the body of God's family, the body of Christ, God's family. Am I a citizen of God's eternal kingdom? It's not enough just to listen about it. And it's not enough just to get some information. That's some cool, that was some cool facts. And never really enter into the kingdom of heaven. Am I part of God's eternal family? Are you today? Jesus promised, promised in John 14, 6, I am the way. I promise you. That's a promise. I promise you. I am the way to heaven or to the Father. I promise you. I am the truth. You can believe me in this. I promise you. I am the life. Just like he promised Mary and Martha. Hey, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the life, guess what? No one comes to the Father except through me. No one enters into the kingdom of heaven except through Jesus Christ. No one gets their sins forgiven apart from Jesus Christ, faith in Christ. He died and took your punishment and your penalty and my own so that whoever believes in him can have their sins forgiven, their souls saved, and receive the gift of everlasting life in God's eternal home or his eternal kingdom of heaven. If you know John 3, 16, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why? So that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's a promise. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No other way to heaven, no other way into the kingdom of heaven, no other way into God's family, no other way to be forgiven, saved, or receive that life except through faith in Jesus. Through faith in Jesus. Are you believing in Jesus right now? Trusting him. You know, there's, there's passive faith, there's active faith. Passive faith is this. I'll give you an example of passive faith. You say, Jeff, it's midnight outside. I'm looking out the window. Don't buy it. Not unless you're in Oslo or somewhere like that. Nope, I got too much daylight out there. So where I grew up, midnight means dark. So no, I, I, I don't believe you. But it is. Believe me, it's midnight out there. You can bump up the volume. You can extend the verbiage. You can quote Einstein. But nope. I mean, I don't mean to defy you. But everything, every bit of information that's coming in here says, nope, it's not midnight because I can see daylight. I'm not purposely setting out to disbelieve you. I'm just saying nothing registers in here that makes me believe that. Because I believe just, just the information, the way it sifts through, I believe it's daylight. That's passive faith. That's passive. You can't change that. You can't, you know, you can't beat me up and make me believe that it's midnight. I might say, okay, it's midnight. Uh, 
you know, give me a break, you know, just to save my life or something. But down inside, I still believe it's daylight. It's noon. It's not midnight. But then the other faith is an active faith. It's an active trust. Faith, believe, trust, all the same word. just depends on how it's used. Now you might say, Jeff, sit down in that chair. Sit down in that pew right there and it'll hold you up. And I might think, think, I might think well, that, that sounds, that kind of sounds reasonable. Uh, but I haven't really put that into action yet, you know. But if I come over here and if I just sit down, this is pretty comfortable. Now, not it wasn't just a mental awareness that that pew would hold me up. I just sat down in it and completely rested. I could pull my feet up and that pew held me up. I know I was slouching. That's that's active faith. I choose to rest in that pew. I, I put all my weight on that pew. I lift my feet up on that pew. I don't pretend to support myself. That pew is doing everything, and I'm resting in that. Jesus is the same way. Jesus died on the cross to completely save us, not just to help us to be saved. Jesus just didn't get us 75% of the way and said, okay, the rest of the 25%, did I do that math right? The rest of that 25%, let's see what, let's see what, let's see what you can do with it. He didn't, he didn't do that. Because Jesus knew that if he, if he died and paid 99% of my death penalty and left 1% up to me, guess what? I would forever be 1% away from heaven. Jesus as our hymn says, paid it all. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. The Bible says we have all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, right? How many times have we, can we, we can all repeat that? And the payment for our sin is what? Death. Eternal death. And so when Jesus died on the cross and he shed his blood for us, he was paying for your penalty. Payment for sin is death. Jesus paid the death penalty for you and for me as he hung on Calvary, died, and, and shed his blood. All of it. That is the only way to have our sins forgiven. That is the only way to have our souls saved from eternal punishment. That is the only way to enter into God's family or the eternal kingdom of heaven through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the beginning and the rest of our life past that beginning is our journey, our spiritual journey along the narrow way. Am I a citizen of God's kingdom of heaven? That's the most important question. And then secondly, as believers and followers of Christ, does Jesus really have first place? Just before chapter 7, at the very end of chapter 6, Jesus says this, Seek ye first retirement, right? Is that what it was? Oh, no. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. Are you genuinely a true believer in Jesus? And is he absolutely first place in your life? As we learn more about Jesus, we learn that he is our wonderful Savior. He is the mighty God. He's the only way to heaven. But also, he's our friend. He's God, Jehovah Shammah, the God who is with us. Jesus himself said, I'll never leave you or forsake you.
He is our friend. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. Father, we thank you for uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us this message 2,000 years later. Lord, thank you for all that you are to us. King of kings, king of the eternal kingdom of heaven, savior of the world. Thank you that we have opportunity to be citizens of that kingdom through faith in Jesus. To walk with you through the rest of of our earthly journey, knowing that you're right there with us. Thank you for all that you've done for us in this life and in the life to come. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's take your hymnals and turn to one, once again to 435 and let's stand and sing. What a wonderful friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege that we can carry everything to him in prayer. So as we think about prayer and his kingdom and Jesus, our great friend, let's sing with all our minds to him. certainly thankful for all that you've done for your love for us to send your only begotten son Lord Jesus we thank you for being obedient to your heavenly father that you would come to die and on a cross be punished for us and shed your blood and die to pay for our sins we thank you Lord Jesus Holy Spirit we thank you for convicting us for illuminating us helping us to understand the truth of the gospel, convicting us of our own sins so that we can repent and confess. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come and indwell every true believer in Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that this week as we go out that you would open our eyes to see the people in spiritual need all around us, people with physical needs, problems all around us, Lord. Help us to be and to share Jesus with all of them. Thank you again, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.